Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. There you are. Uh, praise the Lord. Looking good in here today. All you that showed up yesterday and help with that, what a blessing you are. Uh, thank you and for making it so pleasant today. Uh, of course, the rain came down. Some folks are allergic to water, so they'll get to enjoy it next Sunday. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's good to see you today. It's good to be in Houston. I was in Dallas yesterday. The weather was about like this, but cooler. So I decided to bring it back with me. So uh, the cool part's supposed to catch up later. So it's good to see you today. Praise the Lord. Richard Bateman's even here. Praise God. Backslider. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hola, <laughs> Brother Lance. One of those few Sundays, the lights must not be as bright. I can see your faces. That's scary. So <laughs> we're continuing with a series of messages on the glorious church. And uh, as we've been going through this study, I hope it's been a blessing for you. By the way, this coming Sunday, is there another slide before this one? If there is, would you put it up? If not, don't worry about it. Yeah, there it is. Uh, someone asked me the other day, are we having church on Christmas Day? My response was, duh. <laughs> That's like, like not having a party on my birthday or something, you know. We, certainly we're going to have a party. We're going to have some fun. It's the Lord's birthday. What? I mean, what a great day Sunday for Christmas. So we'll be having a special service. It'll be a great day, and we encourage you to come. Uh, be here at 1045. The service only going to last about an hour. Uh, both of our ensembles, both campuses, will be joining together for the music part of it. We'll be having a lot of praise and worship and special music. It'll be, a, it'll be Christmas Day together as the family of God. There's nothing more fun than getting together with the family of God. Amen? In fact, that's pretty much what we want to talk to you about today is fellowship, that kind of that lost factor in so many people's lives. We talk about the church. We talk about a lot of things and uh, important things at church and functions of church and what we do and how we do what we do. But I want to talk to you about what I think is really kind of a lost aspect of church life. And even when we talk about it, I really don't think we understand it thoroughly. And that would be in regard to fellowship. And that's part seven of our series on the glorious church. Fellowship. Now, when I was growing up in church, I don't know about you, as a, as a kid, I thought fellowship was something that people did after church. You know, they'd have a fellowship. There's a fellowship immediately following in the fellowship hall. We have had a hall for fellowship even. And so we would go to the fellowship hall, and there we would fellowship. And by that, we would have some coffee and tea and cakes and cookies. And maybe we'd have a youth fellowship, and that meant pizza and girls. All right? So <laughs> all those things were important to me as a young man, where I thought I understood what fellowship was and what it really meant to have fellowship, but I didn't understand at all what fellowship was. And perhaps that's your thinking today about what fellowship is. Well, you know, it's, it's getting together and, and having some cake or something. It goes beyond that. So that's pretty much what we want to talk about today. The scriptures tell us in Ephesians that we are members one of another. And in discovering what that really means, I think then we can discover what fellowship means. Because the beautiful thing is that God has made us members of his family. Uh, in the book that we've been kind of taking some of our, our, our study from is by Anthony Evans called The Glorious Church. And that's the book our, our cell groups are using on Sunday evenings to go through. So if you're, if you're not a part of that, you're really missing a, a deeper part of these messages because we get a little deeper in to each one of them. But in, in the book, he tells a story about a man who wanted to bury a loved one, small community. So he went to the, uh, the leader of the parish in that small community and said, I would like to uh, bury my, my loved one in the cemetery here. And he said, well, <clears throat> they're not, they, they weren't a member of the church and you're not a member of the church. So, you know, there's really not even that much room left in this particular cemetery. So we don't bury anybody there that's not a member of the church. Well, he was a little disheartened and went home that evening. Next day, someone had told him that a grave had been dug inside the cemetery, inside the fence. So he went to the parish leader, and the parish leader said, yes, I've changed my mind. He said, uh, he said well, I thought you said there wasn't any room left in the cemetery. He said, uh, well, we moved the fence. We, you push out the fence, we made some more room. But I want you to know that's exactly what the Lord has done for us. He's made a place for us within His family. We become part of the greater family, the family of God. And that's the basis of all our fellowship is through Him and from Him and for Him. It all works by Him. So we understand that fellowship flows from the grace and from the throne of God. So we look at this today in context. I want to talk about, the, first of all, the reality of our fellowship together. The reality is this, that, that the church is a relational entity. It's, the fellowship is a relational reality that reflects the relational nature of God. So what do you mean? Well, God is a trinity. He's a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And he lives in perfect fellowship. Someone said God has never been alone, has never known loneliness. Well, only really in one time in history has that ever happened. That was at the cross when Jesus Christ paid the price so that we could become part of a greater fellowship, that family of God. So Jesus dies on the cross, cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time in all of eternity where there's been isolation from the triune Godhead that Jesus paid the price for our sin. Then he was received back into that, that, relate, that fellowship, but sin separated him for that moment in time. Well, praise God that because he became sin for us, the Bible says, who knew no sin, that we can be made right with God. And being made right with God, then we are brought into this great fellowship and to this great family of God, and we get to participate in that family. John 8, 29, Jesus even said, He who sent me, he's with me. He's, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. I find out what pleases God and please Him, and God is always with me. He's always present. In fact, Jesus passed that on to us when He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But the Trinity is unique because in the Trinity, we find God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and they're living in a perfect fellowship together, and now God has brought that to us. He creates man, and even in the garden, He tells man it's not good for man to be alone. Now, that's chapter 2 of Genesis. If you're familiar with Genesis at all, you know that Genesis chapter 1 is the whole of creation. Chapter 2, we get a little bit more of the, the subpoints. We see it a little more clearly the process of that whole chapter 1. In chapter 1, it says that God created man in his image. And he made, and said, and God created them male and female in his image, he created them. About three times, it puts the emphasis on the fact that God made man in a plurality. He made them male and female in his image. In other words, God is a plural entity. Now that God made humanity, he creates man. And it wasn't like God said, well, I'm going to create man. Let's see how it goes. And you know, if that doesn't work, then we'll do something else. You know, he creates man and puts him in the garden. But always in the mind of God, according to Genesis chapter 1, is to create them male and female. He made man. All right? So man is that general term for these two beings, male and female, that God creates. So it's in God's mind to create woman. In the timing of it, we see in Genesis chapter 2, where he creates man, he places them in the garden, gives him the warning about the tree, gives him some responsibilities to go name the animals that are in the garden, and he goes out to do it. And obviously it says at the end of the day, there was no help meet found for Adam. In other words, Adam looked through the garden and there's nobody there to solve that alone problem, all right? I mean, just of all the animals there, there's none found. And then it says, so God, after saying it's not good for you to be alone, he created the woman out of man's side. So you have here, now I know some of you may think that God says, you know, I made man, that's not quite good enough. Let me see if I can do better and made a woman. That's not, that's not the context of that passage, all right? But he made them male and female. This is a plural relationship. So even in the creation, God is showing man that relationship is important. And he creates man. It's not good to be alone. Woman is created. And then he, he, he brings us into this glorious family called his church. When Jesus called the 12 disciples, even in the beginning of this ministry, he says, and he called the 12 unto himself, named them by name. And it goes on in Mark to say, so first of all, that they would be with him. And then it says that they would share his message and he gave them power over the devil. So of all the things that man, even the disciples in the beginning, were called to as part of purpose, destiny, direction, first and foremost for man is that he's not alone, all right? But first, that, that fellowship, that relationship problem is going to be solved in our relationship to God, first and foremost. We're never going to find fullness of life. We're always going to feel kind of... A, separated in our heart and in our mind. We're going to feel like there's a missing piece somewhere until we come to a relationship with God. I remember an illustration as a, as, a, as a young believer that a lot of people would share is that, you know, there's this, there's this hole inside you that you try to fill up with all the different things of life, and none of those things will satisfy you because it's a God-shaped hole. And until Christ comes into your life, you're never going to feel completeness and fullness. God wants us to have a relationship with him. And isn't it beautiful that when he calls the disciples to himself in Mark 12, he doesn't say, and he called the disciples to himself so he could teach them lessons. He called the disciples to himself so he could show them the inside trick. No, he called the disciples to himself so that they would be with him. That was the number one thing. And by the way, that's the number one thing for your life. God wants you to have fellowship with him. God doesn't want to be a stranger in your life, someone you go to only in times of despair. 
God wants you to walk with him, and God wants you to have fellowship with him. So he calls them to himself so that they would be with him. And if you study the scriptures, you see this beautiful thing about God, whether it's God having his bride in Israel or Jesus and his bride in the church, you see that God has called us into fellowship. And then he's called us into fellowship even as the body of Christ. I mean, it is so important to the church's proper functioning that it stands as one of the foundational activities that we are called to and that we engage in. Yes, there's discipleship, there's worship, proclamation, teaching of the Word of God, evangelism. But you know, something that is often left out of all those important things that we talk about, we do, we function in, is this important thing called fellowship. And I really don't think, as I said, from the way I grew up in the church and the way I understood fellowship, that we fully understand just about what that really is fully and completely about. But it's, it's what the scripture calls koinonia. It's sharing in the life together that God has for us. The Greek term for fellowship is that word. Koinonia. We did a study on 1 John earlier on in the year in, in, on Wednesday nights, and we talked about what that word meant. 1 John's whole letter dealt with that koinonia, that it means that we share in something common to us. There's, there's a common life. There's, there's something that we share in together. One man, I remember you seeing the illustration, he said, fellowship is like two people being placed in a boat. They have to, if they're going to get where they're going, going to accomplish the purpose of being in the boat, then they're going to have to share in that process and share in the common goal together and participate in the goal of being there together. They both row. They both row in the same direction. One rows at the same pace as the other, so you don't go in circles. And a lot of people haven't understood that in their marriage, in their churches. That's why there's so many divisions and so much strife because we don't understand what fellowship's all about. It really gets down to this. It is the mutual sharing of the life of Christ among believers. In my home fellowship is the mutual sharing of the life of Christ in my family. But the bigger picture that God has called us to, and one of the main responsibilities of the church, yes, and we'll talk about and have talked about a lot of those responsibilities, but you cannot forget this all important aspect of what God says that we are a family and we have been called into fellowship together. And our fellowship is not based upon some obscure thing. We fellowship in the truth of God. As I said, when we did the study on 1 John, the theme of that book deals with fellowship. 1 John 1, 3. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we proclaim to you also, so that you may have koinonia, you can have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. John starts out that letter by saying, I have a purpose in writing this letter to you. And my purpose is that you can understand what fellowship is. He said, we, speaking of the apostles, we had fellowship. We were called to walk with him, to be with him with the Father, with the Son. We, had felt, we, we touched Him, we tasted, we've seen, we've heard the words of life, we've handled it. We know what the relationship is all about to be with God. And we've enjoyed the fellowship with God and with His Son and with each other. And now I'm writing so that you can understand what real fellowship is all about. So you can participate in what we participated in, and that is the very life of Christ. That we can share in that life and share that life with one another. Galatians, when Paul's kind of telling about his introduction into missions and he and Barnabas going out, how the church recognized his minister when he said, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be the pillars, gave to me and to Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They'd seen these men's lives, they'd heard their testimony, and they welcomed them into the fellowship. So as we do with people who have a common goal of loving Jesus and knowing Christ and being what God's called us to be, the doors of fellowship are open to us, and we extend that opportunity and that right hand of fellowship to those who want to join in that ministry. Now, if you look at 1 John specifically, you, talk, you see very clearly where he's talking about the dimensions of fellowship. And, and there's really two dimensions of fellowship, and we've talked about them often. But the first dimension, and we talk probably about more than any other, has to do with that vertical aspect of fellowship. This vertical relationship with the Father and the Son. The way John starts out there, he says, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. That my first place, my first priority is to walk with God, to know God, to have fellowship with God. But it doesn't stop there. That is only one side of the proverbial coin. That's only one aspect of, of, the, of the whole thing. The second thing he says is, is about the horizontal relationship that our fellowship is with. Let me go back. That's a nice picture of Tony Evans, by the way. The, the horizontal aspect of fellowship is our relationship with one another. That not only do I know God now, but you know God now. So we both know God, but it's not just you knowing God, me knowing God. Now we share in this life together. I mean, you could get fellowship and relationship in a lot of places. 
but there's nothing like the body of Christ. You can join the Kiwanis and the Rotary and the Quilting Club and the Bridge Party or whatever else you might want to be a part of, the golf team, the fish team, or whatever else is going on. And you can, you can relate on a lot of different levels, but they're really pretty marginal. They're pretty in the big scope of life itself. You know, your fellowship is limited to that. Not so in the church. We have this great eternal God we have, who has so many parts to him as far as the aspects of his glory and his dimensions of his grace and character that he's called us into fellowship. And now we know him together and we join in together. And it deals with all the other things. In fact, so many things are so selective when it comes to fellowship in the world, but not our relationship to the Lord. There's not this selectiveness. He has thrown open the doors wide to us. And this is where I want to show you this quote from Tony Evans out of his book. He said, you know, everyone is welcome in Christ, regardless of the background, their class, or race. That's why we can't bring the world's mess of prejudice and exclusiveness into the church. It's not that we deny who we are, but we subjugate those issues to the greater cause of the gospel. We are all unique beings in this room. I mean, one thing that I love about Believer's Fellowship is our diversity. And that, that doesn't hinder us. I think that, that makes us greater. I mean, it makes us more... We've realized it's not about this class, this education level, or lack of education level, this area of wealth or not wealth, this, this kind of uh, class of race or, or, or white or black or brown or polka dotted or anything else. All that matters now to us is that God be glorified and God has brought us into His presence and has made us one and has brought us into His family. Now we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we realize... It's not about groups and class and race. We are one holy race, as the Scripture says. And that's a beautiful thing. That's the kingdom of God. If you've got prejudice, you're going to be miserable in heaven if you make it. Go ahead and praise the Lord. That's worth praising the Lord over. Well, I tell you, you want to go one of the centers of the world of class, not even class, racial hatred, you don't even go to America. Let's go to the Middle East where we see Jew against Gentile. You look through the scriptures, you look through history, and you see the hatred, the diversity, the differences, in the, you know, of all the things that, that come up. But no one, I mean, not, in fact, no president in our history, no world leader anywhere in history, has ever been able to join those two groups together until Jesus steps on the scene. And when people come into that fellowship, I have seen Jew and Arab and Christians love each other in Christ like no other group of people in the world. Only God can do that. That's the power of God's fellowship. It just it overrules and overrides all those issues that we put out and in front of us and make things like barriers. The Bible says that wall, that separation has been broken down. And now Jew and Gentile, all men, all races can come to Christ and have fellowship and unity with God and with each other. Now, the unique thing about fellowship is that it reveals to us the unseen. And this is why it's so important we understand fellowship. The world doesn't see God in a visible way until they begin to look at Christians who love Jesus with all their heart and with all their mind and with all their soul, and they begin to see just how real God is. And I think this is the power of what fellowship and what God intended for fellowship. God wants to make the invisible visible. How? He wants to make himself visible through you and me. 1 John 4 says, Beloved, that's you and me if we're saved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's seen God at any time. Why? He's not visible. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. In other words, they can't see God by looking out there, and, but they can't see God by looking into here. And when they look at us, they can see the love of God, and they can see the presence of God, and they can see the power of God, because no one else can do what God has done in our lives. No function, no group, no society can do what Christ has done through the precious blood of Christ by bringing us together and bringing about the uniqueness of our life. His presence in my life, his presence in your life becomes real to other people as other people Behold you, love each other, and love God together. God makes himself very near and very clear when we get right with God. A lot of Christians are praying, Lord, draw me close to you, while they are estranged from every other Christian, while they don't want anything else to do with other believers. Well, you don't have to be a member of the church to be saved. No, you don't. 
You can be saved and not be a member of the church. But I want you to know you're going to be a lonely person and you're not going to experience the power of fellowship and you're not going to experience the grace of God because God wants to make you a vehicle to express his love. But if you're a vehicle that's parked in some garage there, you're not doing any good. You've got to get out, move out, and be a part of what God's doing. This is family. And in this family relationship, we discover the great power of God and the invisible God becomes visible as we reveal his love and his grace to other people. In fact, I believe that our fellowship as believers begins to validate our real faith in Jesus Christ. Our participation in the body of Christ vindicates the reality of your relationship with God. The Bible talks about how that the world will know that we are believers by our love for one another, by the unity that we express with Christ, because we're not little isolated people. We are joined together and sharing that common life together. So as I walk with God and as you walk with God, people know that there's something different about our life. 1 John 4, we read a while ago, basically says, you really can't have intimate fellowship with God if you can't have intimate fellowship with everybody else. If you and I can't fellowship... And how am I going to have fellowship with God? Some people say, well, I want to walk with God. I want to be close to God. But they want to ignore everybody else. And God, they say, God, fill me with your love. But they don't want to be a lover. <laughs> they don't want to love people. They don't want to reach out to people. They want to minister to people. They don't want to share the love of God. And why would God do anything in our lives? Because it's, that's not his nature to be like that. God's not selfish. God's not a lone ranger. God's, God, again, is this relational being who wants us to experience this relational life. So if you don't have time to be bothered with other people or to be ministering to other people, it's kind of like God saying, I don't have time to be bothered by you. Now, he does minister, but that ministry in your life is going to be limited. I believe the quality of our fellowship kind of gives us a, a valve or really maybe a gauge that indicates if God's really working in my life or not. If God's doing something in my life, it doesn't stop here. Every person who experiences the grace and the power of God in their life, you'll see if, if, if it is a biblical experience, a valid experience, then that pours out into other people's lives as well. So it, it gets down to the simple truth. Listen, God wants to do something through our life. Our fellowship as believers, yeah, we pray together, we study the Word of God together, we share needs together in other ways, that, that and, and, and we share our victories together in a lot of different ways. We connect with each other. But it even goes deeper than that. True koinonia goes beyond all those things, and God begins to do something big. It's not just us being nice to each other. It's not just us taking a little money out of our wallet when somebody else has a need around us. I want you to know this, is the, this, this church, this bride of Christ, like any good bride would want to have a relationship with the groom, we are loving God, and the more we love each other in our loving God, the more that God is glorified in our life. And we get into this thing we want to talk about called the, the power of real fellowship. It starts like this. We know love by this. He laid down his life for us. Amen? Go, don't stop there, though. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let me back up. He laid down his life for us. We should lay down our lives for each other. And then he goes on to this. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart, issues of the heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, do not let us love in word or with tongue. How do we love? We love in deed and we love in truth. I believe that Bible tells us that we've experienced the grace and the love of God, all right? The Bible calls that that agape love. You know, that, that love that's higher than every kind of human kind of love. It's that self-sacrificing love. For God so loved, he gave his only son. That's true agape love. Now, God says, I've done that for you. And if you love God, then that same kind of love that I've placed in you by the power of the Holy Spirit living in you, that love will pour out into other people's lives. So love involves doing, not just saying, I love God. But if I love God, that visible God moved beyond just the verbal declaration where God becomes manifest in my life. And then that grace of God, not just me acting in, in kindness to someone. I mean, God himself begins to flow through my life. He touches the life of somebody else now in a way that meets the need. He touches their life in a way that makes a difference in their life. Just the way that he touched my life, met the need in my life, made a difference in my life. Now... I'm operating out of that love. Now God's doing something in me because of his love. Now God's working in me. So it's not me just being, well, I'm a benevolent kind of guy. You can turn on the news and you can see benevolent people who are atheist and pagan or Buddhist or whatever, don't know anything about God. 
But there's something different and there's something higher and there's something glorious about when we who really know God and are loving God allow that love of God to flow through our lives to other people and to other situations and the power of that fellowship becomes obvious in that God is working. This is the power of fellowship. And I hope you realize by now that there is a supernatural power. The Holy Spirit is uniquely working in our lives when there's this dynamic relationship with God. And when there is, guess what happens? (coughs) Excuse me, there's a dynamic relationship with other people. And with it, it becomes reciprocal. You, you're ministering to me, and I'm ministering to you, and we're ministering to the Father, and the Father's ministering to us. And out of that comes the glorious God, and it's, it's the power of shared commitment. And you see this throughout the Scriptures, especially in the book of Acts, when the church began. You get a real good picture of what God was doing, what God was desiring, when you see how God moved in that first church. And the book of Acts is, says all the disciples, remember, <coughs> on the day of Pentecost were waiting for the moving of the Spirit, that God was going to send His Holy Spirit. And He says, you wait there. In Acts chapter 1, it says, and they were, they were all with one mind and one accord, and they were continually devoting themselves to prayer. The Lord had told them to go up and wait. Guess what they did? They didn't go up and wait. Yes, they did. But see what they didn't do. They didn't have a board meeting to see if they were going to go wait. They didn't see whose opinion would be best in the situation. They knew what God said, and they went to do it. Amen? It's kind of, we don't have to have board meetings on certain things in our life, folk. We know what God wants us to do. We just need to go do it. You know, and some people, well, I'm just waiting to feel led. There's nothing about feeling led. It's about being what God's called you to be. And one of the things he's called you to be is an interactive part in his body. This is what was happening. They go in obedience to the word of God. The Bible says shortly after that, on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. One accord, says the King James Version, and the Spirit came. Great demonstration of power. God moves on the scene. What if they'd been there bickering? What if they'd been there fighting one another? <clears throat> what if they'd been there arguing over the best seat in the house? Or who was going to be in charge of what? It wouldn't happen. I'm God moved in, in power, I believe, because there's this unity that was happening in obedience to the Word of God. And as you follow through the events of Pentecost, it all you see, you see all of it pointing to fellowship in so many ways. The days following, it says, and they faithfully, faithfully devoted themselves to koinonia, caring about God, caring about each other, sharing the life, along with teaching the Word, sharing the Lord's Supper and prayer. You know what the church does today? We are very careful to be devoted to teaching, taking the Lord's Supper, praying. But what about fellowship? I mean, people, they've lost the whole context of what it means to be in fellowship with other believers because this is the culture of the Lone Ranger. We don't want to have to put up with people. My goodness, I can't stand people. I, I remember seeing one of the little... Peanuts cartoons one time, but those Charlie Brown, he's walking along, he's, you know, he said, I love people. He said, no, he said, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> I know people like that. I found myself in that situation being frustrated. Said, I want people to drive you crazy. Hey, Jesus loves people. Jesus died for people. Get your heart right with God and get right with people to see what God does. Verse 44 goes on down. He says, and all those who had believed were together and they shared things in common which is another form of the word koinonia they shared things in common we have this shared life you know you can't say that about a lot of things in a lot of places that you are in life but in here and among the family of God we have this shared life we have a savior we love dearly each of us loves dearly who gave himself for us if you follow through this here they are they're practicing this true fellowship so in doing that, they really didn't have a problem sharing their possessions with one another. In fact, in verse 45, and we'll talk about this in lift groups this evening, where Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira, all that went on in the context of fellowship. But Barnabas was one of those guys in there who gave everything, you know. He just gave it all to the church. But it goes on to say while this ministry of the Holy Spirit was taking place, as God was moving, that there was just this heart work that God was doing. It says they were of one mind, and the believers were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They weren't saying, oh, man, i got to go to the men's fellowship. I've got better stuff to do with my time on Friday night. I can stay here and watch football all by myself. <laughs> i got to go to that ladies' thing, fellowship with them women, bunch of hen peckers. 
I don't want to mess with them old ladies. You, know, our mind, you say, I would never say that. But doesn't our mind drift in so many different ways to just isolation? Thinking somehow we just get away from everybody, life would be better. And God is saying, you need to get in with everybody. That's when life is good. We'll be looking for a way out. We'll be looking for ways in. Acts 2 concludes that whole thing with all this fellowship taking place. And the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved. What happens when people get in fellowship? When the church is really of one heart, one mind, excited about Christ and love with God and loving each other. People want to be a part of that. Fellowship leads to birth. In marriage, I'm trying to be a simple again, this is a, a G-rated sermon. <laughs> in marriage, it leads to babies. In the church, it leads to newborns, babies in Christ. When we stop fellowshipping, you watch. When we start getting distance, you watch. People don't, not as many people getting saved. But we're in unity, and hearts are tuned in with one another, and we're loving each other. Lives are being changed, and hearts are, are being touched, and people are being saved. I mean, this church had power with God, and this church had power with other people because the presence of God, which what makes up our fellowship, the presence of God, wasn't just being stifled and held in. It was being released. We let God out of our lives. We let God go in our life. You know, we said so often, oh, God, come into this place. If you're here, he's in this place if you're a Christian. It's suspect, oh, God, get me out of the way so you can get out, so you can fill this place. And as we yield and as our hearts are open and our lives are open, God moves in great ways. And so now we have this relationship that begins to pour out. Other people want to know what that's like. In fact, the power of God was so obvious when you continue, it says everyone was feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. It doesn't say this. Even in the original language, it doesn't say many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles and there was a great sense of awe. No, the sense of awe came from the fellowship, the signs and all the other things just happened as a result of the fellowship. And I still believe the same thing. When hearts are right and there's fellowship within the body of Christ and it's, it's all built around Jesus Christ, God's presence moves in. How many times you sit in church and say, man, the Lord was there today because there was such a unity, such presence, such worship, such hearts and minds united directing ourselves to praise. We talked about praise last week, how important we come. We praise God. What happens? We're fellowshipping. And I believe God is honored in so many ways when we come together and our hearts are joined together in praise and worship. And we have this real fellowship taking place of one mind and one heart and one spirit. I mean, do you get the point here? that the Holy Spirit showed up because these people were right in the heart of purposeful fellowship. God's power was obvious. People are sensing God's presence. So true koinonia not only frees God up to do more for us, listen, to this, it frees God up through His Holy Spirit to do more among us because I'm open and I'm concerned and I'm committed to you and to the body of Christ. And even we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit for the glorious church, and that part five, I believe it was, and how in Ephesians 5 it says that we need to worship God and we need to be filled with the Spirit. And it talked about singing and making million hearts, psalms of the Lord, unto the Lord in your own heart. And after that, after we're filled with the Spirit, read through the rest of Ephesians 5 and 6. It all deals with relationships. The rest of it is all about relationships. Relationships in the church, relationships in the home, relationships on your job, that wherever you are, because you're filled with the Spirit, you're touching people's lives. You're not, you're not closed and boxed in. You know, you're not, not wrapped up in yourself. You're living out a life that gives out. And out of fellowship, I believe, not only do we see this, one of the powers of fellowship is the, the shared commitment, you know, here. It's the fact that there's this, this, this generosity that flows out of this shared life. And I believe that the great example of this koinonia is at the end of chapter 4 and beginning of chapter 5 in Acts when it says, you know, the congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul. Not one of them claimed anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. Now, I know some Christians read this and shudder. <laughs> Where's my wallet? He's not talking about communism, okay? This is not communism and socialism. That's when they take it from you. <laughs> Whether you want to give it or not, and you are hit with the fees and the permits and the taxes or whatever it might be, and you will share it. This is where the love of God comes in, which is far greater than anything governments can do. When we are concerned about people, 
we're concerned about hurts and we're concerned about needs and we suffer when we see a brother or sister in Christ are suffering. It bothers us and we're disturbed by it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's filling our life and He's given us this love for, for, for the Lord and He's given us this love for one another so we're moved by it. So the generosity comes out of the overflow of this koinonia relationship that we have. Do you understand the difference between that and what we, we think in the context of communism? We want to help. And I think the whole idea here is that these people were so consumed with a love for God, they began to understand everything that I have in my life is a gift from God. Everything, everything I possess in my life, everything in my checkbook, my savings account, my garage, my house, the house, and the, it's all His. Everything in it. The Bible says the earth is His, and it's everything in it is His. I mean, the cattle on a thousand hills and the oil under the hills, it's all His. Everything belongs to God. And these people realize, you know, God has been so good to me, and every gift I have is from above. And how can I, as a child of God, who's experienced the grace of God, see my brother in need and not love on him and try to help him and try to minister to him and do what I can do for the family of God and for the people of God. And I believe when all this broke out in Acts chapter 4 and people are moving and ministering and giving, that didn't break out because somebody was orchestrating it. Just God showed up. People cared about each other. You know, it just happened. It's a natural response. I remember when 16 years I traveled in evangelism, revivals and crusades. Our income was based upon love offerings, what we call them. Most of them were more love than offerings, but anyway. <laughs> I think the church decided to split the offering 50-50. They'd keep the, the offering part, I'd get the love part. But anyway, a lot of it happened as a result, you know, people take an offering during the context of the crusade revival. But I, I kind of had a, a gauge that I could go by to know what would happen by the end of the week when the check would be handed to me. I knew it would be a healthy check, a good check from the church if revival had broken out. Yes. If the pastor had gotten right, if the people had gotten right, and fallen in love with Jesus and in love with each other, I knew God would take care, fully care. That the need. And I always knew God would meet the need no matter what they did. God was going to meet my need. But I knew their response to it would be based upon the activity of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And, 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 but if there was, if the, if by the end of the week, I mean, you may have seen God do some things, but if there was still this separation, this division, bitterness in the church, hard-hearted no towards other people's church, and that hadn't been broken, people mad at the pastor, the pastor mad at people, that kind of stuff that goes on in churches, you know, if all that hadn't been dealt with, there wouldn't be much happening. That's why so many evangelists come to our church and have always said to me, every evangelist ever walked in this church, we go in off to says, I have never received an offering like this from any church I've ever been in, and I'm talking about churches that run two and 3,000 people. Why is that? Well, you, you take a good offer. No. It's because people love God, yes. and they love the Word, and they love His men, and they love the ministries, and they care, and they realize that God has blessed them, and they can be a blessing with what God has blessed them with. And we also realize that in giving, I also get more. So I can give some more, amen? <laughs> that there's this fluid flow that comes to our life. But I believe one of the great signs of God working in anybody's life is this attitude of generosity. Why? It's the nature of God to give. So thereby it becomes our nature to be like that and to give as well and to be committed to give the way the Lord wants, wants us to give and the way He gives. So we can't be locked up in ourselves. The context of our fellowship, what we talked about if the foundation of our fellowship is truth, right? It's Jesus. It talks about your fellowship and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. The context in which that happens, it, well, it happens here where we gather together as the family of God. The Bible makes it clear that the church's fellowship occurs in the context, in Hebrews it says, in the assembling of ourselves together. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Break that crowd up, nothing happens. Amen? If they're not, if they're, if they're not together, one place, one mind, God's moving, nothing happens, going to happen. Which means to say, nothing's going to happen out there by yourself. Happens within the context of our, our assembly. I, I, I believe there's three important admonitions when you go to Hebrews 10 where this is mentioned, in which, the, in which all this is set. Now, the, the major context is this. Since we have this great high priest over the house of God, who is the high priest over the house of God? Jesus. It's not Pastor Joe, all right? I, I am just a little priest of the Lord for myself. You're a priest of the Lord, but the high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, since we have Jesus as the head of the, as the, head of the house, He's the family leader, all right? He's the, he's the groom of the bride. He's the head of the body. 
the, the church, all right? It's Jesus. And since he is the head of the body, he talks about several things. And one of these, he talks about drawing back. So what we, we need to assemble ourselves together. Since we have this great high priest among us ministering, hey, then we're to do three things that he mentioned. Three important admonitions are set forth here. The first one is, since it's true that Jesus is over us, uh, let us draw near. Not draw back. Let's draw near together before him in worship. And I wish that somehow that we could all just come in here on Sunday mornings and have in our mind that, you know, we're the bride of Christ that's gathering here. And when we stand here to sing these songs, we ought not be looking at seeing what somebody's new hair color is or latest clothing is or what they drove up into church in. You know, we ought to come in here and set our hearts on unity to glorify God and to worship our, our Heavenly Father, and to worship our, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our High Priest. And let us draw near together in him, to Him in worship. And then the second thing, he says, and let us hold fast to our common faith, which is in Jesus Christ, in that verse 23 of Hebrews 10. First thing, don't draw back, we draw near. Second thing is, we're drawn near really in worship. Second thing is, and we're... We're holding fast our common faith that we have together. And there's nothing greater than that. And what makes us one is this common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, the third thing is, so, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds and not forsaking our own assembling together. Now, this is a powerful formula, folks, for the church and the ministry. That if we want to establish a, a, a context or an environment where God is moving, then this is what we do. We realize that we're in the very presence of our high priest, Jesus Christ. And we come together to worship him. And we're holding together what we have in common, which is Jesus. You know where people get upset with each other? The things they hold different. We have too many things in common to worry about the differences. The, far, the things, our commonality far outweighs any differences that we might have. And I try to teach this in marriage seminars, amen? What, what God has given you in your family far outweighs all this other stuff out here that seeks to, to, to divide us and to divide our churches, divide our homes, our relationships, our kids from parents and parents from kids, all those things. To put it in a nutshell, I think this is the Tony Evans translation of this in, in, in the book that he talks about in drawing back and what this particular thing means. He summarizes it, let us not stay at home. Even though it's rainy. Even though the cold front's coming. Even though the baby's diaper is wet and you have a sniffle. Let us not stay at home and draw back from one another in isolation. Let us do what? Let us draw near to God and to one another so we can hang in there and be strong Amen. together. We know the verse in Ecclesiastes, the cord of two strands and three strands is stronger. And, you know, it's better that there's two in case one falls down, the other one help me out. The whole idea here is fellowship. Fellowshipping around the Word of God, fellowshipping in, in communion, fellowshipping in study of scriptures, fellowshipping in worship, that we are together. But even beyond that, fellowshipping, helping each other to be what God has called us to be, that we can stand together. We stimulate one another, he says, to love and to good works. King James puts it this way, and we provoke one another. Well, some of us are pretty good at that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with provoking each other as long as you're provoking each other to love, to good works. You know what that means? That means that when I see you and you see me, we're, we're saying hang in there. We're saying, hey, let's stay at it. We're saying let's help each somebody. Let's, let's, stand, let's stand together and worship God together. Let's, let's minister to somebody's needs in the power of Christ. Let's do something for the glory of God. Let's make a difference in the world that we're in. We need each other. God is moving in our midst, and that should flow out of me into the group. If God's moving in you. It should flow out of you into the group. We stimulate one another. We encourage each other. While it's called today, it says... He said, but don't, like as the habit of some, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Church is not something you do occasionally. It should be the habit of our lives. A bad habit is to come to church occasionally. Amen? Just come to church every once in a while. Hey, I did church twice this month. That's enough. <laughs> That's a bad habit to get into. In fact, I didn't say it. Jesus does. The Word of God says that that ought to be enough. Get into the habit of meeting with brothers and sisters, not just on Sunday, when opportunities are given for us to come together and fellowship. We ought to embrace those opportunities. One thing that we're very careful about at Believer's Fellowship is not just having meetings for the sake of meetings. Yeah, I mean, I've seen so many churches destroyed by that. Just, I mean, it's every night at the church and pastors. I, I remember we, we lived in a certain part of town, and I would go by this church. Back when I was in evangelism, you know, I'd see this pastor's car at the church every night I drove by. I'm here telling Kathy, I said, I bet his home life really stinks. 
I bet his marriage is in shambles. He's there every night. He shows up for every event, for every... What's this... You know, at least he's dedicated. Sure enough, his home fell apart. Didn't last. We're very cautious about keeping priorities and priorities. We don't have meetings just for the sake of meetings. And you know, you know that if you're a part of the planning process around here. What we do is what, we will make sure that what we do is within the context of the will of God to encourage you in your life and encourage you in your ministries. Since we don't have it like that, that's why pastors and ought to encourage people to attend. And that's why believers ought to intend, encourage each other to attend those things. And that's why husbands ought to attend the wives to go to the retreats and to meetings. And wives ought to encourage husbands to go to those meetings. Because we do it on a, on a, on a basis and on a level so as to help you, not hurt you, and not to harm you. But don't be like those who have bad habit and don't do anything. Come, be a part of what God's doing. Experience the grace of God in your life. Enjoy the fellowship. Why? Because this is where you get encouraged. It's where you get provoked. Encouraged to do what's right. Listen, every one of us are fighting battles. I mean, if, if I were to give us time today and say, I'm going to put a mic right here, come up here in 10 words or less, tell us what battle you're fighting right now. You'd all have something to say. Am I right? All right. It's just, I mean, it's, it's sometimes, you know, everybody say, well, it's just hell by the acre. Hey, it's hell by the inch where I live. How about you? you know, <laughs> in the life that I live, it's always a struggle somewhere. Amen. And it gets discouraging. You know what Satan's favorite weapon against me is? You know what it really is? You know, a lot of people, well, I think I could guess. You know. well, I'm sure you have your own opinion, but mine's the one that counts in it because it's me. <laughs> All right? There's some areas he hits me with, but he knows it's, it's going to be a quick hit because he's not going to work on me. Right. You know, I, there's a victory in those particular areas of my life. I've been doing this for 100 years, so it ought to be some kind of victory in some levels of my life. But he'll come anyway just to try and, and look for soft spots. But there's one he, can, he knows he can always hit me with. I, I, and, and you're the same way. Not me. Yeah, you are. You know what it's called? Discouragement. You just get discouraged. You want to put your sword down by your side and lay your shield down. If not, drop it. <laughs> Say, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired. This is not working. It seems I'm just plowing away here, and nothing's going. Where are you, you know? And you just get discouraged. But when we come together, and we are the, acting as the people of God, then there's great encouragement of that. And not just in here. I, I know you. It's, I get texts from people and emails from stuff that are encouraging, and I need that, and you need that. We all need that, you know? I appreciate it even when you lie to me and say, that was a great sermon, <laughs> yeah? I, that blesses me, you know? You know, like the one preacher standing there at the door, and the lady says, well, that was a great sermon. He said, no, it was the Lord. And the lady said, no, it wasn't the Lord. He preaches much better than that. But <laughs> it the Lord had been a lot better. But those are encouraging things, and we all need it because we all are fighting at different levels, and we're all dealing with different things. And it's encouraging when the church starts being the church, all right? I was, I was just fighting some discouragement this last week. And I was frustrated over, you know, just some things and just... In ministry and just, Lord, you know, what's going on here? What are you doing this and things like that? And then, you know, I, I was looking at all the wrong things. We have a tendency to do that. And then I saw some of you being Christians, <laughs> acting like believers. I heard about people ministering to somebody else. And I heard about somebody who, who just, under the cover of everything, nobody knew about it, just reached out and helped a family that was in desperate need. They didn't have to have a flag being wove or put a name on a brick and put it on the front of the building. <laughs> Amen. You know what that did? That encouraged me to see you doing what you know God's put in your heart to do. And I think that's the heartbeat of what he's talking about. And we use this verse in funerals a lot, I think. But it's the truth in every area of life. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction. Don't stop there. And then you praise the Lord for that. But it goes on to so, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. What's he saying? Listen, there's that time when I just need something from God and God gives it to me. And God says, okay, you like that? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He says, it's your turn. You go do that for somebody. You go be that for somebody. You go stand in that place for somebody. I didn't just do that just for you. I did it for you, but it doesn't stop there. It, you become that distribution. That's fellowship. And that's not just in finances. That's sometimes an encouragement. Sometimes it's in praying for somebody. 
I'm standing out at the church this morning at the Magnolia campus, and a guy's standing out there, and he's got his hands on his head. And I said, what's the matter? He said, uh, he's standing there with three other men. And he said, oh, I just got this headache. He just came on. He's just splitting the headache. He's killing me. And so I asked the other man, have y'all prayed for him? Uh, no. <laughs> Listen, now that person, when he told him he had a headache, he probably wasn't, didn't know what he's doing just telling me he had a headache. What's the matter? I got a headache. But we have to think with a little more sensitivity. Right. Especially at church. <laughs> you got a brother. Can I pray for you? Do you know what that does for somebody? Amen. And I know a lot of you always tell, hey, I'll pray for you. And then you don't do it, you big liar. You know, you know what I try to do to keep from being a liar? I just pray right there. <laughs> just pray right there. Amen. Just take the moment and say, let me pray right now. And you know what that does for somebody? It might not do anything for you, but that's not the point, is it? You can just be the hand of God that reaches out and touches somebody. And sometimes we don't even know what to say to somebody, do we? There's times we, we just don't have words, but that's all right. You know, you just put your hand on the shoulder and say, I love you. Let me pray for you. God, you know, I, I don't know how to deal with this, but you do. We just want to come to you in Jesus' name and ask you to comfort in this situation, meet this need, touch this, touch this issue, touch this life. Make a difference for this person. It's exciting to see what God does in that realm. Amen? Amen. Listen, but if you decide that you're just happy to live an independent life, which is really a self-centered life, kind as I can say it, if you're happy to live that way, then you're going to miss out and what God has designed for the church in the context of bringing us into family. And I know sometimes we come from dysfunctional families, right? I, I told somebody one time, I put the fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> we have dysfunctional families, but this family isn't. Amen. All right? And even though the family we come out of, there may be problems and pressures and divorces and hassles and issues and heartbreak, you know, God still gives us grace to bring grace to that situation. And he still gives us mercy to bring mercy to that situation. And he still gives us forgiveness so we can bring forgiveness to that situation. But in this family, there's not a one of you are, that are disqualified from ministering to somebody. I don't care if you're young, you're old, whatever. You can make a difference in somebody's life. People are hurting. and People are dying. That's why when the church is functioning in fellowship, it makes such an impact upon a lost world. Because they can't get this anywhere. Can't get it anywhere. But in the glorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit living in us, we can make a difference. It starts here, and then it pours out amongst us. A great illustration that Evans uses in his book. I could relate to it completely. Some of you will be able to relate to this. How many of you work, uh, perhaps have to drive in downtown traffic? You know, you're going downtown on work day Monday, and you've got to sit in the traffic, and, you know... God forbid you live off 290 somewhere and have to go to town. You know, those, there's just certain places that are just miserable, you know. You know if you get stuck there, you're going to be there an hour. It would ought to take 15 minutes normally. And you're sitting there in traffic and it's putting along. Put, 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 And then it stops and it's go. And then you look over to your left. You know what's over there? The HOV lane. <laughs> They're just flinging by you. You know, now how'd they get over there? Well, there's one stipulation. You've got to have somebody in the car with you. There's got to be some form of fellowship going on to get in the HOV. They ought to call it the FOV lane, you know? <laughs> the fellowship occupancy lane. It, it, you know, it, the only way you're going to get in that lane and enjoy moving forward is to have somebody else in the car with you, right? That's why they call it high occupancy. You know, it's more than you. You know, and you're sitting there, and you're looking at those people. It buses going about 50 miles an hour. You, come on, I'm moving five miles an hour here. A whole boatload of people just went by. It stinks. Well, maybe you ought to make some friends. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and get real smart. So I'm gonna get over there and see what happens. You know what's gonna happen? You're gonna get down to the end of that line, and somebody's gonna be waiting down there with a ticket book, and you're gonna get penalized for being in that lane. There's a price to pay for that lane. Just try it. See if I'm not right. Don't bring me the ticket, except it's proof. I'm not going to pay it. And I think sometimes we, just real, we don't realize that that's what God intends for us to be in fellowship. And there's blessings, you know, like the high occupancy. There's blessings, and there's forward movement. And you get where you're going, and you get there a lot faster. 
and you enjoy the ride a whole lot more. If you're that kind of person who's kind of chosen to kind of be this independent little person, you know, uh, you're like out there budging along in traffic. You know, you're sitting there and that traffic flow is just barely moving along and, you know, with all the other little spiritual lone rangers in life. And God's not going to get bogged down somewhere, you know, along uh, the line of, of, of your life uh, and, and stop his blessings. God's going to keep his blessings flowing, but he does it to those of us who are willing to walk in humility because that's what it takes, a surrendered heart and a love for Jesus and a willingness to, to be hurt. Because, it, you know, you're going to get frustrated and you're going to, get, you're going to get hurt when you get out in the fellowship lane and start living out there because some people don't understand or some people might even take advantage of you. They have the Lord for centuries. But if we're, we're never more like Jesus than when we're giving and forgiving. I'm going to say that again. You're never more like Jesus than when you're giving and forgiving. That's the grace of God working through our lives. Would you stand with your heads bowed? A lot of times people come up to the...